بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین وسلاۃ وسلام علیہ رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم ویلکم آڈینس ٹو دا لیٹسٹ ٹاک ان دین پوڈ کاسٹ آئی ایم یور ہوسٹ ماجد اینڈ ٹوڈے آر ود می مائی کا ہوسٹ ایز یو یو بردر راش اینڈ آلسو وی آر ویری اسپیشل گیسٹ ویری اسپیشل گیسٹ آل دا وے فرام دا یونائٹڈ اسٹیٹس آف امیریکا دس بردر از اے لانگ ٹائم ایکٹیوسٹ اینڈ داوا کیریئر ہی از اے گریجویٹ فرام ہاوی یونیورسٹی and also uh, the founder and founder of the Muslim Skeptic website and also the founder of the Alasana Institution uh, and it's no, uh, no other than Brother Daniel Hakikachu and I hope Brother I've mentioned that correctly. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yes, mashallah, that was a good pronunciation. Jazakallah khairah. Okay, mashallah, mashallah, barakallah free. So bro, um, it's a long list of credentials that I had to uh, read off there. Uh, but uh, I know uh, in America, and especially amongst the, the da'is and, and activists, um, as we've seen on the internet, you, you know, you're well known, alhamdulillah. Uh, but in regards to uh, the, our UK audience, uh, mainly our UK audience here, uh, it'd be good, inshallah, if you maybe uh, gave us a bit of information about yourself, uh, some of the things I mentioned on the Alasna institution and uh, Muslim skeptic and, and uh, basically even the, the, the background of your name, because people will be interested. <laughs> Sure. Uh, maybe we'll start with the background of the name. Uh, so my uh, heritage is from Iran, uh, from Persia. And my um, great grandfather was actually a Qadi. He was a judge in Iran. And at around that time, they stopped identifying uh, who you are by your father or your lineage. And they started using last names. This was a kind of westernization. So He, uh, he was known as a judge, and so they gave him the name Hayraju. Uh, Hayraju comes from two uh, uh, words combined, uh, or a word and a suffix, Hayrat, Haqiqat, meaning truth, same as Arabic. And then Ju is a suffix within the Persian language, which means seeker. So the name means truth seeker, and that is what they called him. And alhamdulillah, you know, that's a name that I try to live up to and I'm proud of that. Um, my family uh, immigrated to the United States. I was born and raised in the U.S. I went uh, to college at Harvard University. Uh, around this time, I was becoming more uh, religiously conscious, learning more about the deen. Uh, I became Sunni. I, I was Shia. I became Sunni. Oh. And uh, alhamdulillah, you know, at, that, at this time, it was very exciting to learn more and more uh, about Islam. But it was also a very difficult and confusing time as well, because in the, as anyone who has gone to Western University or college knows, it can be a very anti-religious place. And it was definitely anti-Muslim, anti-Islamic place. Uh, just in- intellectually, they're constantly, constantly criticizing uh, Islam and the ideas uh, found within the Quran and the Sunnah and so forth. So this became a challenge because as I was learning more about Islam, becoming more religiously conscious and practicing, alhamdulillah, at the same time, I'm learning the other side, you know, the opposing side in the university. And so I was studying a variety of subjects. Physics was the, my major Uh, primary subject was physics. I also studied philosophy as a secondary and then Islamic studies. And it was a struggle, you know, it was a struggle to uh, reconcile these different ideologies with Islam, these critiques of Islam. Uh, but alhamdulillah, you know, I uh, try to reconcile and I try to find right answers because it's one or the other in many cases. Uh, either it's Islam that is correct, Islam is true, or these Western ideologies that are opposing Islam are true, one or the other. It's, in many cases, they're mutually exclusive. Uh, so I dedicated myself to studying more, uh, studying Islam traditionally, also studying these ideologies more deeply and investigating their origins, their roots uh, in Western philosophy. So as, okay, If this is what I'm being told is uh, the truth, you know, the idea of uh, universal human rights 
uh, universal women's rights, uh, a woman's right to choose, uh, freedom of religion, uh, freedom of speech, uh, the universality of all religions, and all that matters is that you're a good person, and it doesn't matter so much what you believe. All religions are essentially the uh, same path to God. So all of these ideas, let's investigate the origins of them. Let's investigate where do these come from and do they truly make sense? Are they coherent? So I wanted to do that kind of uh, critique and deconstruction analysis. And that's why I studied philosophy to essentially turn the tables uh, on these ideologies. You want to attack Islam? Okay, let's see if you can stand up to the scrutiny. So alhamdulillah, that became something that I pursued within graduate studies as well. And then I you know, realized that this academia is a very intolerant place. It's a very hostile place to Muslims. Uh, and I couldn't stay within that environment. I decided to uh, you know, pursue other avenues of employment. At that time, I got married as well as was starting a family. But alhamdulillah, I went into corporate America and was working in different uh, career paths there. But I wanted to make use of this education and help um, other Muslims uh, struggling with these same kinds of doubts that I had. And so that's what I did. I started writing online, muslimskeptic.com, putting out articles, putting out material on these ideologies and how to deconstruct them and how to achieve... uh, Iman or Yaqeen or uh, confidence in Islam, not feel that inferiority complex because of these ideologies, because it's you find out that the emperor has no clothes, you know, once you actually get to the bottom of it. So that was the goal, and I was doing that for many years since 2011. And then I decided to start an institute, a Lesna Institute, and uh, dedicate to teaching. Uh, a, a curriculum uh, on these ideologies and how Muslims can approach them. And alhamdulillah, we've, uh, Alastair Institute has been around for a year now. We teach on-site and then we also have online classes uh, that people can take and are taking around the world, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. SubhanAllah, so there's, there's quite a lot happening. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I tried to summarize it. <laughs> it's a really good summary. Alhamdulillah, we see a lot of people where I've got I've been given the vision that people who have studied philosophy actually you see some Muslims who've studied philosophy as you said based on some of those battles actually going further away from Islam so alhamdulillah the fact that you've taken your kind of studies in philosophy and then been able to utilize that to kind of almost expose some of these ideologies and kind of crystallize and clarify Islam for people I think equally that's when we we were discussing on you know people to have on, on the podcast, you know, the things we were discussing is we're also trying to, you know, expose secularism. We're also trying to tell Muslims that it is this secular society which is having a very negative impact on them. And again, that's where I think those synergies are. And we were quite interested to have you on, brother. So, alhamdulillah, no, really interesting to hear, you know, the bite size way you presented that. But subhanAllah, I think what's really interesting also is the fact that so you actually went into philosophy purely to counter the philosophy. Well, it was at first I was thinking that. So the, the longer story is that in physics, I uh, was raised as a secular Muslim, basically uh, secular Shia Muslim and uh, physics. I had understood or science in general. Science has the answers to life's problems. Science has the answers for questions of how does the universe work? How, you know, who, where are human beings from? Uh, What is the best for human, for humanity? So that science was put on a uh, pedestal for me and I wanted to pursue the king of the sciences, which is physics. So I always had an interest in physics and that's why I was studying at Harvard. But when I was there, Uh, with these professors, I realized that not everything makes sense. And there are some issues when it comes to understanding certain physical concepts uh, that are just assumed within uh, physics, theoretical and experimental physics. So I would ask uh, these professors, uh, and some of them had uh, been considered for the Nobel Prize, or they were definitely top of their field in physics at Harvard. 
and they couldn't answer the questions. They they really were very dismissive, even and rude, and saying, "This is Daniel. You uh, shouldn't uh, involve yourself with these kinds of questions. This is not what a physicist thinks about." So that's very intellectually unsatisfying, <laughs> right? Uh, there's this kind of uh, wrong, bad stereotype about Muslims or especially imams or shuyukh that will say, oh, don't worry about this issue, just close your eyes and believe, just be a blind follower. But this is what they were teaching and promoting at uh, this institution, which is supposed to be you know, world-renowned for its intellectual curiosity. I didn't find that exactly to be the case. If you question their dogmas, uh, they're very <laughs> sensitive about that and don't, don't want to have that exposed. So then I, I went into the next step. I said, look, if physics doesn't have the answers, maybe philosophy is going to be a better bet. And that was in that period that I re recognized that, no, philosophy has the same kinds of dogmas. And they're, they've also built their structure on very uh, weak foundations. And they don't have answers to many of these issues. So at the same time, I was uh, learning more about Islam, getting stronger in terms of ulum ad-din. And alhamdulillah, I decided to kind of switch orientation and say, okay, now I can turn the tables. I'm already studying philosophy here. Uh, why not just use it to some better end uh, and use it to our, for a more critical end? It's not going to provide answers but it's going to help me understand where this deviance is coming from, where these poisons, these diseases are coming from that unfortunately affect increasingly uh, the Muslim mind. Subhan, I mean, that leads on nicely to the actual uh, the topic because what we want to discuss today uh, with you, Brother Daniel, is uh, what are the sort of challenges that Muslims are facing today, uh, certainly in the West, and some of them you already you mentioned and we can go into more detail. So, you know, uh, with that point, what do you think is the greatest challenge today that Muslims are facing in the West? The greatest challenge? The greatest challenge is modernism. That's the greatest challenge. This is the umbrella term that encompasses all of these different ideologies like uh, secularism, liberalism, uh, feminism, materialism. Uh, all of these ideologies are under the larger umbrella of modernism. So that's really the big problem today. It's not just for Western Muslims, it's also Eastern Muslims. It's not just our generation. Now, I mean, this time, it, things are getting worse and worse. But even my parents were affected by this. My grandparents were affected by, they were secularized even though they're living in Iran. And as you know, at one point, uh, Persia was the epicenter of uh, ulum, uh, Islamic sciences with the great ulama scholars coming from Persia, uh, Sunni scholars, before it changed. And so now <laughs> within two, three, four generations has been very highly secularized. My own, like think about my own family history. This is what I reflect on, that my uh, great grandfather was a Qadi, like he was a religious scholar. And then within one, two generations, that's completely gone. All that link, that link to knowledge has been cut. So we have this major problem of uh, modernity, secularism, affecting uh, Muslims East and West. Yes, yeah, subhanAllah. I was watching one of, uh, one of your videos. I think it was the one with the interview with, uh, uh, there was, I think, I don't want to call him Imam, but uh, Tawhidi, is it Tawhidi? In, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't really want to call him the Imam, but uh, but yeah, and Subhanallah, when you mentioned in there about uh, modernism, because a lot of Muslims when they uh, hear the term modernism, modernity, they may well think it's just talks about it's just talking about modern times, okay. And some people might even turn around and say actually, um, Islam is compatible with modernity because in fact what they're trying to say mm. is that Islam is. Is relevant. relevant all the time, but the reality is, like you said, modernism or modernity, it means something specific, and Islam is actually, you know, uh, contradicts modernity, you know, because with the, the, the issue yeah. of secularism. Um, so, you know, with these institutions, whether it's the schools and, and, and the colleges and universities, uh, they are pumping out this, uh, uh, this ideology. As Muslims, the, the issue I think we have is, I mean, you've just mentioned there how in about three generations, you know, from uh, your one of your great-grandfathers being a Qadi, and uh, I think you mentioned your family were secular. 
So what we can see is that if uh, Muslims don't have those foundations uh, from a, an early age, and then they are they enter into these institutions, um, then there can be a challenge, especially if where the parents themselves are not really uh, cultured in the deen. So you know when the children are going to the the university, the schools, and they're being told to critically think, and when they come home and they ask questions of their parents. Mm. And they don't get an answer or they get some cultural, you know, mystical type of answer. From their point of view, it's like, you know, this doesn't agree because like you mentioned, science has become the benchmark. Nowadays, Muslims, they try to show that Islam is the truth because it is in line with science. Okay, so it's like as if science has become the ultimate truth and Islam is only the truth if it actually agrees with science. So what I know you've started the Alasana and I'm sure this is the sort of thing that you're doing. But what is the, 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 the short term or even the solution itself for the problem that, you know, Muslims have without, you know, with not having the culture there? Where is it that Muslims can be cultured? Where do we get the deen from? The, it's hard to give a solution uh, that we can talk about in a five minute answer. But the problem, we have to first recognize the extent of the problem. I think that's really the first step because this is not, like I said, a recent problem. It's at least uh, 200, 250 years. Uh, it began with uh, the colonial period. The Muslim world was colonized and all of these ideas were pumped into the Muslim world. And what, what is the uh, people watching this or listening to this might ask, well, what is the problem with modernity or modernism? And why does it conflict with Islam? The, the main core of modernism is this idea that change is good. We have to continuously change. We have to continuously update. This is the only way that humanity can progress. Or this is the only way that humanity uh, can live is through constant evolution, constant change. And so it's very clear how this is contrary to Islam. As Muslims, we understand that the best time was the time of the Prophet wasallam. The best uh, generations were the first three generations, the Salaf. And after that, and after that, and it's been a constant uh, decrease, devolution. Uh, it, over time. So this is the complete opposite of what the progressivist says. The modernist says, no, people in even 50 years ago were living in the dark ages. <laughs> people in 20 years ago, and, and there's this funny uh, phenomenon that we see where uh, people uh, in who are only 20 years old, 25 years old, they go and watch TV shows that they were watching when they were teenagers. Just 10 years ago or less, fewer than 10 years ago, and they say, oh, this TV show that I loved as a child or as a teenager is so bigoted, <laughs> it's so racist, it's so, it's non-woke. And so they have, even 10 years, uh, the morality has to change and update. So uh, this is the core of what modernity is. And if, uh, as a Muslim, you don't have to go to the university to, to get this uh, idea. Once this idea is in your head, it's it's just from the environment. This is just, modernism is the ideology that in, it's in the air, it's in the water. Everyone is breathing it and drinking it. So, um, what is the the solution to this? Well, I mean, this is uh, recognizing the problem first of all. Recognizing how these ideologies work at a deep level is a is a big problem. But as Muslims, we understand that it's not just theoretically, that the heart is affected, right? It's not just knowledge. There's also the spirit. There's also the qalb, the heart. And there are many things that affect the Muslim heart, the qulub, right? Uh, and obviously, ultimately, it's in the hands of Allah and Allah can change the hearts. But um, when it comes to what affects the heart, things like your family, the family is so critical. What is happening to the Muslim family? This is a question that we need to ask. The same kinds of problems that are affecting uh, the non-Muslim society, the, the breaking of the family, the destruction of marriages, the husband doesn't trust the wife, the wife doesn't trust the husband, the children are nowhere to be found because they're out with friends. 
and their their con- central concern is with their peers. This is called uh, peer orientation by psychologists, where children are lo- no longer looking to parents for guidance, which is what is uh, natural, and this is what uh, is the how Allah has created human beings. Instead, children look to their peers for guidance, to their friends, to their social circle. How has that situation? Uh, arisen? Well, it's because of the school structure, the institution of uh, grade school and so forth, putting children into these institutions from a young age at four years old, even three years old in pre-K. So it's a very big structural problem uh, that creates uh, the breakdown of the family. And then when you break down the family, that affects the heart. Uh, It's not clear that uh, the modern, you know, it's not clear that modern family, the family unit or modern social structures where it's just individuals by themselves, uh, the only kind of friends a person has is his coworkers at work, maybe, or the person he sees on the bus, uh, public transport going to work. Like that's the extent of people's social interaction. In this day and age, where's the family? Where's the extended family? The the aunt and the uncle and the grandparents and the cousins and all of this. Everyone's busy with their own lives, right? So then can Iman really uh, flourish and grow? Can Taqwa flourish and grow in the hearts uh, of people who are living this kind of life? This is a, this is a structural issue. And that's schooling and, and all that. That's just one example. But there are many examples like this. So when I give this kind of spiel or I'm teaching this, uh, people ask me, like Muslim students will ask me, Daniel, this is very depressing stuff. <laughs> this is, uh, you're, you're painting a very sad picture. And, and what's the solution to this? And I think that we have to go back to the Quran and Sunnah in a very real way and appreciate the wisdom of the Qur'an and Sunnah, because the Qur'an and Sunnah provides the solutions for these kinds of problems at a structural level if we appreciate the Qur'an and Sunnah, if we go back to what the ulama are teaching and have taught traditionally about the Qur'an and Sunnah and the way that they have lived their lives traditionally, because the ulama are the ones who are preserving that lifestyle, they're the ones who are preserving that form of life. Uh, that is very, it's, it's seen as something medieval or from the dark ages when, uh, you know, the non-Muslims will look at how, you know, the, the lifestyle that ulama are preaching, the guided ulama. So this is something that uh, is too complex to boil down into a five or ten minute answer. But the nutshell is that really and truly the answer does lie in the Quran and Sunnah. We have to have the, the confidence and the love uh, for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to follow that and to follow the Sunnah, to appreciate truly the wisdom uh, that is contained therein that may have been lost by some Muslims who unfortunately, not, not through fault of their own, but because of the environment. I mean, it's so overwhelming, just constantly, constantly. Imagine a huge wave that is just pouring over people and, and many will drown. Like that's just the way that it is. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ, uh, described to us and forewarned us of uh, within ah- many a hadith about uh, you know, the signs of the hour. No, I would also just add to that. It kind of does seem quite fatalistic at times, as you were saying, because I think because secularism, especially we're, we're witnessing this in the UK now. I'm sure you know, having some listened to some of your talks as well, you've mentioned similar things here in the UK because we have on one side we have prevent that is an issue similar to CVE over in the in the US and globally. Um, so we have Muslim parents who are very fearful of if the, anybody wants to teach the deen, which is larger than, you know, just learning the, the Quran from a recitation point of view or anything more than that, if they want to learn about Islam, all of a sudden this fear tactic, which is coming right down from state level, has meant that Arguably for a lot of Muslims it can be quite fatalistic because you have the media 
being Islamophobic. Mm. You have state sponsored like policies that are clearly, you know, academics are saying that these things are not proven. You know, these things are, are incorrect. This is not how you kind of run a, a civilized society yet. Though the prevent is continuing and CVE is continuing, even though there are people who are speaking out against it. But as Muslims, people are then fearful of learning more about the deen. So I understand, you know, we, we all have to do our bit. And no doubt that has to come from the Quran and Sunnah. But I suppose it's quite difficult when you're in this surrounded light. You described it quite well, like a wave, you know, where secularism is all around us. Um, it's like a tsunami. It is really, isn't it? So how is it that if the society, which we know the society affects us, every one of us, and it's more likely that the society you are in will affect you mm. rather than you affecting that society, mm. it does sound quite fatalistic, but, you know, really, how are we going to overcome that? And that's where, you know, I think that's where we need to help the youth and help people who are being kind of washed away by that tsunami. I, I, th I think also from what Brother Daniel said about going back to the, the Quran and the Sunnah, I think, you know, there's the, the Islamic tradition where just one, just one, uh, element of it is the mission of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know we have many people um, especially from the subcontinent background mm -hmm. you know we celebrate uh, we do the milad and we you know we sing all these these songs about him and we should we express our love but the reality is is that what people fail to understand is what was the what was the point of the messenger mm -hmm. sallallahu alaihi wasallam what was the what was his mission and this was the mission which us has his ummah we continue and i think a lot of people now, unfortunately, the way they see Islam, and it's changing because we do see more youth mm. uh, inclined towards Islam. But I think a lot of people, uh, they see Islam in a, they may not put it this way, but it's like in a secular fashion. So you have your set of rituals, which you'll do. Mm. But when it comes down to uh, how you uh, live your life, how you govern your life, on what basis your relationships, uh, you know, on what, what criteria your relationships are based on, it's like Islam does not even have a they didn't, mm. it isn't even a consideration. Mm. It's not even a thought because this is not something which has been shown. And I know, uh, probably, obviously, bro, you're in you're in America, and uh, I think there is a difference between uh, from what I've observed. I've heard other people say this as well that uh, in the UK, for example, uh, we are seeing a, a little bit of a of a revival amongst. A lot of the the, the youth, um, but in America it's slightly different because obviously I think the whole so the society there is is different in a way where, you know, as as children of immigrants, when our parents came over here, they came over here to to work and originally they may have had the intention of going back after a few years, but they stayed and then we grew up and etc. Right, but we were never. Uh, we were never accepted here. We were just called, you know, uh, racist terms. <laughs> and even if you go back to Pakistan or Bangladesh, you're seen as a foreigner, right? So we always felt that that you know uh, feeling that we, you know we, we don't, don't belong. belong. Okay. Whilst in America, from what I've heard, you know, f from a, from a young age, you're taught in school that you're American before everything. Like you're American. You're this identity, America, America, America. Hence why you may get some Muslims that are probably a bit more patriotic or nationalistic. Uh, rather than being uh, more inclined towards, uh, you know, uh, Islam, or shall I say that Muslim identity, that connection with the rest of the Ummah. I mean, is that something that's actually happening in America? Yeah, I think that's accurate uh, description. You have a lot of uh, patriotism uh, in the U.S. from the Muslim community. Uh, more in certain places than others, of course. Uh, there are Muslims who hold it down, so to speak. <laughs> But when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, the American flag uh, hijab <laughs> or, uh, you know, these kinds of symbols, uh, you do have it, um, unfortunately. And there's a very strong sense or, or um, drive from certain areas of the community to want to assimilate more and to be prove that we're just we're more American than the Americans themselves. And um, the concept of being American, like, okay, it's a national identity, but what does it actually mean to be American? If it, 
just means to be, if being American just means eating hamburgers and hot dogs and preferring hamburgers over biryani, uh, or I don't know, kushari, if you're Egyptian, if that's all it means to be American, then ahlan wa sahlan, like no issues there, right? Um, or you want to wear a baseball cap instead of a kufi. Okay, well, Allahu alam, like what do you want to prefer? That's up to you. But the issue is that being American means more than just these things. It means adopting certain values. When you say, are you American? A lot of people, when they say that, they often mean, do you support everything that the government does? Right? When it comes to invading uh, the Muslim world, uh, occupying, this is what they mean. Like, are you American? Or are you American means like, do you agree with these Christian values? Do you agree with, um, you know, things like women dressing in a certain way, uh, you know, being uh, in a swimsuit and going to the beach and these kinds of things that contradict Islam. So if that's what it means to be American, then we have to say, no, we, we don't. We're not American in that sense. If you just mean national identity, yeah, that's a very that can be a very descriptive thing, a plain thing. I was born in America, so I'm American. But what is behind that kind of statement? Like what is being imposed by that and does it contradict Islam or not? And many of the things contradict Islam. Uh, For example, in America, the uh, gender separation is completely uh, unheard of and it's seen as offensive that you would separate the genders. Um, And so that's uh, American value that is being, uh, that has affected some parts of the Muslim community where the the masjid even does not want any separation and if there is any kind of gathering or event at the masjid the masjid has become a kind of community center and uh, non-mahram men and women will talk joke have a good time and this is something that you'll find in some uh, masjid within the american context and in other contexts unfortunately at the like some of the national organizations they also don't seem to have any Uh, interest in maintaining this ethic, these ethics within Islam about gender interaction and so forth. So it's unfortunate that uh, those aspects of being American or being um, British or English or whatever, those are being adopted as well. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, uh, with what you're saying there, uh, I think with the Muslims in the UK, if I speak for the UK itself, uh, we were a bit that, that was what's happening then in America it started a bit late because I remember when the uh, 7-7 uh, attacks happened in, in the UK and at that time the big debate was that multiculturalism has failed and I remember watching a, uh, a talk show they had, you had an American on the talk show as well and what they were saying is that they said multiculturalism failed because people were allowed to come to just say the UK mm-hmm stay in their own areas with their own culture and we thought that was fine but in america we defined what it meant to be an american that was first so what we've seen since that time now now it's like you're saying if british means eating fish and chips on a friday okay then that's fine okay that's fine but tony blair when he was the prime minister he came out and said listen being british doesn't just mean this it means Accepting the values, accepting democracy, accepting X, Y, and Z. Yeah, yeah. So actually, they, they made defined, it... They define what they classed as British values, and then they forced that down people's throats to say, if you do not accept these British values, then you no longer belong. And that yeah. has, you know, and that has actually, the negative of that has that's made life more difficult for Muslims here and maybe people keep away from certain things or maybe they even keep away from dawah activities for example but the positive has been and maybe brother you can tell us as well if this is similar in America the positive has been is a a clash has happened and that clash that has happened has made people who are maybe previously who were quite you know obviously Islamic always but may have felt that they were had been normalized here and they could see a future here, all of a sudden that clash has made the most ardent supporters of these countries, Muslims, 
think again and think do we really belong and actually i think that's actually quite positive because hopefully then those same muslims will say we do need islamic unification correctly like the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam worked towards rather than being happy that our future generations are going to continue to grow up in these secular societies so i wonder what your thoughts are about that no i agree i think that um having this uh, negative sentiment from wider society against Muslims, it can serve as a wake-up call. And uh, some of that was experienced in the U.S. as well, um, but it hasn't had, it hasn't taken, uh, or it hasn't been, had the same kind of impact that I was hoping. So I was hoping, for example, with Trump, um, becoming president in 2017, he was elected in 2016, he took office in 2017. I was thinking that it, it has a positive, it can have a positive because it can show a lot of Muslims that look, this is a president who is openly antagonistic to Muslims uh, and he wears his feelings on his sleeve, he's very open <laughs> about his animosity towards uh, Muslims and even Islam because he said something like uh, Islam hates America or Islam hates us things like that so this I felt was a good wake-up call not that Trump is actually truly more uh, uh, against Muslims and Islam than his predecessors such as Obama or Bush in fact he might be less antagonistic to Muslims uh, than Obama and Bush. But just because he was very open with it, I thought that would wake people up and say, look, we shouldn't have all our hopes and dreams as Muslims in the electoral process. We shouldn't put all our eggs in that basket of uh, American electoral politics. And that's a big, going back to your previous question about Americanism and being American, uh, participating in this drama of electoral politics is a big part of being American. And so a lot of these Muslim groups will say that, look, we are American, that means we have to participate in the vote. And some will say uh, that it is wajib, it is fard that you participate. So they're making this aspect of Americanism like something that is religiously obligated. But that didn't happen. Uh, the that or maybe it did in, in some ways, but overall, Muslims weren't uh, disillusioned with politics. Uh, I think the major groups and the major organizations in the U.S. Uh, that you hear about were not disillusioned from the political process. In fact, it, wanted, it made them want to get into politics even more. Uh, and that's you know what they've been doing, but they've done it at the co cost to their own faith and to their own principles because they've aligned very closely with uh, the opposing party, opposing to Trump, which is the Democrats. And the Democrats, I guess, is analogous to labor uh, in, in the UK. So it's the same dynamic just recently played out, I think, for you guys. But... Yeah, you have Muslims who are so, they think that really salvation is found with the Democrats, with Bernie Sanders or Biden or Elizabeth Warren or all of these presidential candidates. They have so much loyalty and allegiance, you know, if you want to talk about al-wala, like true wala for these individuals. So it's like, what? where is your, you know... I can go on and on about that, but it's disappointing. I think there are some Muslims who do did like wake up a little bit with Trump winning the election. But honestly, if you weren't aware of what was going on with Barack Obama uh, and how he was just droning uh, so many Muslim countries, killing so many innocent Muslims, constantly uh, making these kinds of deals with the Zionists, with, with Israel... He was, and then domestically, he had many programs against Muslims in America. So it was not just his foreign policy, but even his domestic policy was very anti-Muslim. There was one situation where they wanted to build a, a masjid uh, in uh, downtown New York, in Manhattan. And it was just a few blocks from uh, the World Trade Center, where the World Trade Center was. And there was a big protest. No, you can't build a mosque here. You can't build a masjid here. 
And then uh, Obama even came out and said that, opposing this, he opposed that mosque. And he said, I don't think it's wise to build a masjid uh, in that area. So Muslims who thought that Obama was pro-Muslim, uh, they're delusional. <laughs> they, they were either closing their eyes or deliberately ignoring his domestic and foreign policy. I can talk to you for hours about, I, I hated Obama. I really dislike Obama because I feel like he put on a certain face and the reality of what he was doing was pure evil. And, and so more, more than other presidents, I disliked uh, uh, Barack Obama as a president for uh, it, it, what he was doing to Muslims in the US and around the world. Bro, you'll be surprised even in the UK, there were times we speak to Muslims and, and they would say, yeah, but how do you know he's not an undercover Muslim? And it's like, <laughs> come on, you know, it's, it's maybe they're hoping for this, but, um, you know, in regards to Prevent and CVE, and, and just touching upon what you said, one thing I noticed with Prevent, and uh, this is more UK-wise, obviously, you got your CVE there, is that, you know, before, because we've been like uh, in activism and yeah. dawah for qu- quite many years now, and, and before... You know, if there was an issue, the normal Muslim, they weren't really bothered because it was the Dawah carrier that was sort of like in the spotlight. But then what tended to happen is that when sort of like before, whether it was to do with uh, terms like Khilafah, Jihad, and these were seen as a problem, right? But when uh, people start getting phone calls from the school authorities saying, you know, we've taken your son in another room, we're interviewing him. And, and what was the reason? He sneezed and said, Alhamdulillah. Right and and all these things. I think what actually happened is that this had the effect mm-hmm. where the Muslims are thinking actually this uh, this attack isn't on uh, dawah carriers or a certain type of Islam. Mm-hmm. This is actually an attack on on Islam itself. So we have had that sort of yeah. a feeling, but then at the same time, unfortunately, what we've had is we've had certain people within the UK. Some of them are, are sco- scholars and so what they've done is that feeling of negativity and that feeling of uh, what th- actually thinking out of the box now is mm. like you know do we should we be here mm. is this our you know is this our the true society Muslims should be living in what you get then is you get certain movements or scholars who then uh, basically taking people down that route of voting labor Corbyn you know making a Islamic space in this society and I, I personally think that's a big problem mm. because I think, you know, you two spoke about before and you spoke about it's not just the colleges or the universities, the whole society is pumping secularism, modernity, and that's a fact. Media, you know, nowadays, uh, you don't need to go to school, just at home, the kids at home, if they just log on to their laptops and their phones, they're being brainwashed. And with that in mind, you know, I think the, the issue here is that uh, the question, you know, one asks is that when the Muslims are then behaving in an un-Islamic manner, they are just a product of the society. Okay, they're just a product of the society. Um, so what this goes to show really that if people understand Aqidah, if people understood that the Aqidah has you know, a, a spiritual element and also has a political element in the sense like it deals with, it governs with man's affairs, it deals with societal problems. And like you mentioned at the beginning, it has solutions. If we understand Islam in this way, then a Muslim, the next question he has is that, okay, my surroundings and, and my society actually is in total contradiction with what I believe. And I think then if Muslims can get to that stage, then they'll start questioning because there's an agitation for change. If Muslims have accepted the status quo, if they've accepted the American or the British and you know they are foreseeing that their great-great-grandchildren are going to be residing here and they feel no, uh, no problem with the, the, the situation of the world or the situation of the Ummah, I think then what you'll have is you'll have Muslims who will then integrate and assimilate even further. Uh, but one thing that these CVE and Prevent does do is I think it has uh, brought the question to some Muslims, many Muslims, mm-hmm. to actually think, you know what? Why, you know, if, if I'm as British as next, next, this next guy, I've got a British passport, he has. Why is it that when I'm going through the, the airport, why do I feel anxious? Why do I feel like people are staring at me? You know, I've been born here, you know, I do the, exactly the same. Mm. I can't even speak my own mother tongue back home. You know, I'm as English as them. I think this has had that effect where yeah. Muslims are starting to question now uh, what we should do. But I think the problem lies where what we've got now is we've got 
people who are in positions of authority, i.e. Uh, scholars and imams. And I think when people have these agitations and go to them, what they try to do is they try to still direct them to accept the status quo, but try to uh, uh, rally around creating a safe space in this society for them and their children, which unfortunately isn't going to happen. No, you, you can. You can create a safe space. Do you think so? You can, of course. <laughs> it's very easy. The solution to Islamophobia is so easy. Uh, all that Muslims have to do to get rid of all Islamophobia is just be Muslim uh, in name only, right? <laughs> just do everything that uh, is acceptable within the dominant culture. Uh, you give the example of uh, sneezing and then saying Alhamdulillah. Uh, you know, just say it silently in your heart. Why do you have to say it out loud? It's not a uh, wajib, you know, it's not followed. You don't have to do that. So you can always find a scholarly reason, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Just, um, uh, the, and, and some of these uh, scholars, they're trained enough to be able to know it, what, how, how you can use the tools and the principles of the Sharia uh, to, um, meld and mold Islam and the practice practice of Islam as close as possible to what is commonly practiced within the dominant Western culture. So that's what they have the training to do. And some of them are doing this. And they, it's hard for the average person, average Muslim to recognize that what's happening here, what's really at play. You're just, you're dissolving Islam or what is unique about Islam and you're making it compatible completely whatever remnants there is that distinguishes muslims from non-muslims they'll get rid of that and they will find their islamic reason for that hijab that's easy you know wearing women wearing hijab gender separation that's easy you know uh drinking alcohol even you know those kinds of justifications were already given uh by some scholars uh not fasting yeah, there. You know, if you are in a because they used uh, concepts like darura and haja. If this is something that is <laughs> your career depends on you taking a drink with your boss, okay, then this is a <laughs> this is an important need. So there are yeah, you'll find uh, fatawa like this, uh, eating during Ramadan, right? We've already heard uh, supposedly conservative scholars say that if you are a student studying. And it's during Ramadan and you your finals are coming, you have exams, you can break your fast uh, for the purpose of doing well on these exams. Those fat, uh, fatwa, you will find them. Only two Ramadans ago, we heard this. And then the question is, well, if a student can break his fast for the try, the difficulty of an, a, taking, sitting at a desk taking the exam, what about these manual worker, manual laborers and someone sitting you know, anywhere else in, at work? No one needs to fast according to this fatwa. So uh, anything, anything that you can name, uh, you can find these kinds of tricks and loopholes and strat excuses from the principles of the Sharia uh, and, and the Islamic tradition to get out of it. And so we see that process and it's shocking the kinds of opinions that will be expressed. And in reality... Uh, we can't be naive, uh, and this is not something new, it's documented history, but some of these uh, scholars are being paid, and they are their livelihood depends on uh, promoting this kind of modernist, modernism, uh, modernist Islam. And you're talking about prevent and CVE, countering violent extremism, in, uh, I don't know about the UK, but in the US, it was Muslim organizations and Muslim figures who are pushing CVE. And some of them were collaborating with uh, Obama's administration to develop <laughs> the guidelines. And these individuals are as popular as ever. Some of them from the US, unfortunately, like a disease, they're coming to the UK and propagating their uh, poison over there. But this is something that uh, you'll unfortunately find within certain uh, scholars that their interests, even, I'm not saying that they consciously are thinking, oh, we're going to sabotage the Ummah. But they might have very good intentions saying, you know, we're helping the Ummah. But nonetheless, in terms of what they're actually doing, it is extremely dangerous and they're attacking uh, the pillars of Islam.
Yeah, and we've hi- we've highlighted some of this in some of our previous podcasts without going into detail and names again and things like that. But we've we've mentioned some of the names as well. And um, again, like you said, you've had it over there, but we've had it here where there are scholars who perhaps we've not had it to the extent of things like alcohol and and things like that. But That's for, <laughs> yeah, but what we have had over here certainly is um, fatwa for things like you know taking loans for studying, um, taking loans for buying a house, you know, with riba and all of these kind of things. And voting and voting, of course, most recently with all the Brexit vote going on, there was quite quite a push for people to vote because it was highlighted to Muslims that you're a minority, but you can actually have an impact on the decision between whether you know Brexit happens or not. Mm. And again, there were issues that came forward and said it like you've just mentioned that it's wajib for us to vote because we need to help make some change or have an impact on that decision so we are seeing some of those and again those things need to be put out in the open so muslims are aware of them um so yeah or merry christmas merry christmas this was a big fitna because you had uh, uh several Scholars putting out fatwa that yes, you can uh, participate in gift uh, giving gifts. Yes, you can say Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Yes, you can have a Christmas tree. Yes, okay, so that's this is all of Christmas. <laughs> we can just participate. We can celebrate Christmas and have a jolly old time, uh, <laughs> just like everyone else. This is what is, uh, and these are like these. Uh, some of these scholars were considered to be hardliners. They were considered to be ex- uh, not extremists, but they're considered to be. Con- very conservative yeah, traditional uh, odama, traditional odama, and now this is what they're uh, promoting it's shocking really so you know um, I mean uh, some names do come to mind but obviously we're not in the the you know the, the naming game but uh, you know what we're, spe- you're, we're speaking about Muslim. Speak for yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Exactly. Not, not on this podcast, though. We'll leave that for another Yeah, one. yeah, not on this podcast. It's fine. <laughs> but, uh, Don't want to get you guys in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> now, nah, bro, it's open open season for you. If you want to mention anyone, it's not a problem. Uh, not a problem at all. Uh, we've done that in the past. But we have. You know, um, in regards to we're speaking about Muslims in the US, in the UK, you know, the, the reality is that we're a global ummah. It just so happens that we are where we are. But what we're seeing now is that, you know, before when before social media before the internet you'd have to say that there was a difference between um the societies to a certain degree mm. in the muslim lands and in the west certainly in a lot of arab countries what we see is that even though for example the the islamic system the caliphate ended many centuries before but what we see is that in some places still the certain remnants like the social system and certain certain traditions were still there, right? But what we're seeing now is with the with the internet and social media, I think that what this has allowed the uh, you know the the enemies of Islam to do is that to pump out this this secular culture, but in a universal way. So what we're seeing now is that the things that the youth in, for example, in America or in the UK may aspire to, and the things the YouTubers and the things they're into, you can go to places in Egypt. You can go to places in the Muslim world now where, in fact, they like for like. Mm. Uh, they've been able to do this. So, you know, obviously we have Vision 2030 in, in Saudi. Um, so what we're actually seeing is that these ideas that they are uh, pumping in the West, which they would do because this is their, these are their societies, but they're now trying to, well, not now, but they've been trying to for many decades, but it's becoming easier now. They, they're exporting this mm. uh, to the Muslim lands. And obviously there has been rejection. Um, we see this that, uh, you know, whether it's in Iraq and, and Syria and places like this, the fact that P, the secularists there themselves in Syria, for example, they said that, you know, we we use the phrase civil state rather than a secular state because if we use the word a secular state, the Muslim will reject it straight away. So subhanAllah, this gives you, you know, uh, a positive vibe, the fact that if it's something clear, the Muslims or mass would not accept it. But what we're seeing now is that this is now a, a global issue. And um, I feel what, certainly what they're doing in the Muslim lands now is the fact that the Muslims over you know, 80, 80, 90 years of colonization, the fact that they haven't uh, left and apostatized from Islam and adopted their way of life. Now I think their idea is to 
to just go in and destroy the lands, destroy the infrastructure, really take people back 40, 50 years. And as Condoleezza Rice said many years ago, is, you know, call it creative chaos. I.e., from this destruction, you'll get a generation that will link all these problems that they currently have to Islam um, and then aspire to the West. But what are your thoughts on that? Because from the, the feeling that I get and the inter- interaction we have generally, I feel that, you know, the Huck is always going to be the Huck. And there may be certain people in the UK, in the in the US that are, and even in the Muslim lands, but generally we see that uh, there is, you know, uh, there is this, this blessing amongst the Ummah and the fact that the Messenger وسلم, said that there will always be good in my Ummah, that there is this innate uh, rejection of this way of life that's being, you know, pushed down the throats of the Muslims. Yeah, no, I, I agree. There is going to be resistance. Uh, to this um, tidal wave, right? So if we go back to the image of a tidal wave, then um, as long as we hold firm to the rope of Allah, then we won't be washed away. So that's really the um, bottom line for us. Uh, As far as the influence of media, social media, internet, unfortunately, this is the situation where they're watching the same YouTube videos. Uh, one, one of my teachers uh, in Egypt was saying that um, uh, down the street, there was just another person in his neighborhood leaving Islam and asking questions about, well, uh, who created Allah and all of these kinds of uh, questions that you get from where? You got it from the internet. <laughs> you got it from uh, social media. You got it from some of these online forums. So this is, Muslims haven't been immune to that in the Muslim world, unfortunately. But uh, it makes the situation one where we can recognize that we really depend on Allah. And Allah is the only one that can protect us and our children from this kind of tidal wave. Uh, It's it's a very uh, desperate, uh, at times I feel that it's a very desperate situation and My family experienced it, as I said, like my family was completely secularized. Uh, I have 19, I was just thinking about this today, I have 19 uh, uncles and aunts on my father's side. My father had uh, 19 brothers and sisters uh, from uh, three separate wives. But uh, those children, uh, out of the the 20 total, maybe only three of them, I believe, three or four, not more than five, max, let's say five, have any attachment to Islam or or even consider themselves to be like a, you know, devout Muslim. So five out of 20. That's that's the situation. Um, And they're, you know, now that generation, they're in their 70s and 80s. Right. So what about what about the younger generations? Uh, And that's Iran. Iran is one country. But I think when I talk to uh, friends, teachers uh, in other countries, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, Malaysia, unfortunately, now Turkey, Egypt, the Arab world in general, Egypt, I always felt was uh, more religious as as an Arab society than some of the other countries, maybe uh, in North Africa or in Sham. But even there, you find a lot of uh, these kinds of liberal youth who are questioning Islam and uh, ridiculing Islam uh, from Egyptians, which I was shocked by. This is something new. Um, and, and especially post Arab Spring, leading up to the Arab Spring, but post Arab Spring, and I think it's a lot to do with social media. Uh, the internet has been around, right? The internet has been around since uh, early 2000s uh, or late 90s, but social media popped onto the scene 2007, 2008. This is the rise of social media, and this is exactly when we see. Uh, these kinds of negative trends, apostasy, leaving Islam, because it's a, it's a social network. And this is some of the wisdom of Islam, because uh, if someone, if one person uh, starts attacking aggressively Islam and starts uh, saying, I leave Islam and I find and starts insulting the Prophet Sallallahu starts insulting Islam, that will spread like wildfire to all of these other people, all of these other connections through social media. And so that that's like a virus. 
But within Islam, we know, like we can talk about how Islam addresses that just because one person is suffering from a poison, it's prevented so that that doesn't spread and destroy everyone else's akhirah, doesn't destroy everyone else's uh, life, essentially, right? Because so much of Islam is dictating how we live our lives. If you take out Islam, then you destroy the life of that person and that family. Apostasy is something that destro- has destroyed some, uh, and I think many Muslim families, unfortunately. So it's not just an indiv- it's not a matter of individual belief. Uh, it's it's something that affects all of the family and all of society, the entire community, the, and the ummah as a whole, the world as a whole. So Islam has the solutions to these kinds of issues, uh, and we can talk about that. But social media is is a can- is cancerous in that way. Yeah, I think what this does show, and uh, you know, the, the way you would put, put it there is that obviously we know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He He has a plan for everyone, and you know the fact that there may be someone out there who hasn't come across Islam in a certain way, uh, you know, didn't didn't meet a certain person who then you know uh, taught him, etc. Mm. What we see is that Subhanallah, it's a great responsibility on on Muslims, uh, certainly people that are uh, that are already in the dawah or have been exposed to it um, to be able to crystallize the aqidah to be able to understand what Islam is and in order to to propagate it and to, to culture Muslims because like you said you know there's a cancer there's a cancer there and you need those you need that antidote mm-hmm. you know you need that cure to the cancer and that's only going to be the the aqidah the, the you know the Islam and then the victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but it just really goes to show how important the work is for the dawah carrier because, you know, if you think about what you just described there, if that's the situation where now um, Muslims are going off the deen, then you know the only the only uh, way to counter this is to bring them closer to the deen, to to bring them closer to the Quran and Sunnah. And in fact, what you said there, bro, is to to give them life, and that's the reality, and that's why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, you know. You know, uh, you believe respond to Allah and His Messenger, and to, and to that which gives you life, because this is this is the true essence of life. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why you know it's very important that we are involved in this type of activity, and the fact that you know uh, we are exerting ourselves. I mean, like your 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 history, inshallah ta'ala, it shows that from a, an early age when you start thinking about the question, the attack, you know, this has shaped who you are now. You know, and and what your aspirations in life life are, and that's for mm. quite quite a few of us. You know, but it does goes to show that the responsibility, Subhanallah, is great. And uh, obviously, with this Alasna uh, inst- institution, I guess this is the thinking behind it. Because one of the, you know, uh, I watched one of your videos, which is really good. The nine things that you Muslims shouldn't say, and what was key about that was that Muslims today they don't have that confidence. Mm-hmm. You know that confidence that, and it's, it's brilliant how you said you know the the, the non-Muslims don't say, or or the gay person or the homosexual doesn't say. In my opinion, homosexuality is fine. They say it's universal homosexuality is mm. fine. Whilst the one with the huck is the one who skirts around and it happens, you know, yeah, in the yeah. workplace and all that. It happens, but it goes down to that confidence. So I think it's important to you know empower to to give Muslims that mm. confidence to be able to. Uh, understand their deen to be able to understand our history and to be fair what's sadder really is as good as kind of people setting up institutes are these are the things this is the education really we should be having in our mosques we should be gaining this kind of confidence and being able to battle these ideas of atheism these ideas of feminism all of these ideas really i'm much more of an advocate of that being taught in the mosque and i'm sure everybody would ide- ideally i think we would want that but sadly a lot of the mosques and the same applies here i'm not sure maybe same in the us a lot of these mosques are you know are fearful of speaking about these things or are funded or you know in other words they fear a loss of you know um, uh, living if they actually start to talk about things they know that they might get in the limelight for or get in the media for in a negative way yeah so inshallah we lead we can lead by example and others hopefully will follow I think the best argument against the situation uh, of modernism is that modernism is anti-life modernism is a very anti-human destructive force 
and it it, this, it was used as a weapon to destroy um, Islam. It was used as a weapon to destroy Muslim civilization. And I would say that to a certain extent, Muslim civilization was dominated uh, through colonialism. No question about it that Muslims were politically dominated. And the main tool that was used in this uh, ideologically was modernism. But now that weapon of mass destruction is now destroying the West uh, more and more and more. And people in the West are recognizing, non-Muslims, that our families are breaking down. Uh, no longer can a man trust a woman or a woman trust a man. Look at what happened with the Me Too movement, right? What was the Me, uh, Me Too movement all about? Uh, it was that men and women, uh, now you have men who are like, I can't be alone uh, in the office with a woman. I can't go to lunch or dinner for a business uh, meal with a woman, with the opposite sex. Uh, this is something that they're discovering that there are fundamental dysfunctions with the modern way of life and what modernism is propagating. So they're slowly wrecking, they're getting some inkling that, that there's something wrong here. Their fitra is telling them that this is not the natural state that we should be living. This is the perfect opportunity for Muslims uh, to do da'wah and to be confident and say, look, you're having these issues. There's a reason why you're having these problems. There's a reason why your life is miserable and you are going to most likely die alone. <laughs> you're most likely going to die alone in your flat, in your apartment, uh, sitting in front of the t uh, television and you die and there's no one to know that you've died because your children don't care about you. Uh, you have no uh, extended family. You're divorced or you never got married. Maybe you have your dog. Uh, dogs are children now for many people uh, in, in the West. So your dog might be there. He's going to chew your foot while your corpse is in the chair. And then maybe in three weeks, the stench of it will be smelled by your neighbors and then they'll know that you've died. This is the end for many uh, in the West, and unfortunately, uh, we have the answer to this. <laughs> we don't want to follow them into that lizard hole. Instead, we want to provide them with the guidance uh, that, alhamdulillah, Allah has given uh, Muslims. Islam is the guidance that we need to be offering and calling to in a confident way. Instead of trying to accommodate this disease, <laughs> accommodate this destruction. Why, why do we want to accommodate it? Why do we want to uh, bend to it and uh, mold ourselves to it? No, we, they need to learn from us. This is the message that we uh, can give. It's a message of hope. No, definitely. We're having these conversations as well quite a bit now where people are questioning the very roots of things like capitalism now. They're recognizing a lot of the problems in the world are from those very ideologies and beliefs that they thought were universal. And actually, at, the, at a time when their societies are declining, this is like you said, where we should be presenting Islam as having solutions for all of those things. And it just so happens that because they're demonizing Islam so much, Often, someone who is even sincere, that demonization is a layer in front of them to stop them looking at Islam. But actually, if that demonization was not happening, and equally, if we were to be able to say, here's an example of a place in the world where Islam is being implemented correctly, and look at the, the fruits of that society, look at the social system, the economic system, that you know the wealth distribution problems that we see, look, they are all solved here in this Islamic society, mm -hmm. or at least we have those solutions, even if they are not implemented. I think a lot more people would look at that and go, actually, yeah, we're questioning capitalism, so we're going back closer to socialism. But actually, people questioned socialism before, so why is it that we're constantly jumping between all of these falsehoods? Actually, there is something that actually has the truth, and we have to present that in that way, in that crystal clear way, to actually aid both the Muslims, but actually as much for the non-Muslims as well. I think, you know, just, just to add to that as well, Subhan is a really good point. And what, what we see is that, when Islam spread, when this you know when the Muslim armies went and they you know they uh, liberated or conquered a certain land, what we see is that you know not people some people after generations they became Muslim, but what people saw was the actual implementation, the justice, 
uh, that they compared to the Persian rule and the, the Roman rule and, and and this was what they saw which actually you know came to them the 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 thought that subhanallah this indeed is the truth yeah. and i think the problem is is that from what brother you're saying obviously 100% wherever we get an opportunity we need to speak to non muslims also question them make them question their own system and you're right they are really looking for change 100% yeah. but i think that sometimes you know when you speak to uh, a non muslim and and what they'll say is you know you're right yeah, you, Majid, you know, you, you're all right. You're not like the rest of them. <laughs> because what happens is a lot of people, they gauge Islam by the ummah. They don't gauge it by a person, right? Mm. So, you know, I think that um, until that, like you said, that real example of uh, justice, that real example where the, the rules that are implemented agree with the fitra of man or designed for that man, um, I think that uh, until that doesn't happen, on mass you won't see people challenge the authorities because there's nothing else as an alternative. As an alternative. Uh, but inshallah ta'ala, you know, maybe hopefully in our lifetime, we will see that true example. And obviously we know that the West and, and the enemies of Islam are, are fighting very hard to make sure that example isn't there. In the same way the Quraysh were fighting, you know, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even from very early on, they realized that this wasn't just a man who was calling to the relationship between him and, and people to their creator. In fact, this was a comprehensive relationship between the creator, between him and himself, and also with society. They understood that very early on. So, you know, until that examples are there, I feel that we can do our bit, which we have to do anyway. Um, put the seeds in, put the, 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 the seeds of doubt um, and also put the Akida seeds in the Muslims, the correct Akida seeds, and inshallah ta'ala, you know, uh, work towards this. But I think it's important that uh, we have this collective spirit because I think that's something which, you know, a guy gave a crude example once. He said that, Have you ever been to a Pakistani wedding? I don't know if you've been to a Pakistani wedding, bro. Yeah. But if you go to a Pakistani wedding, everyone is in charge and it's chaos. <laughs> so, you know, once this brother said that if, if Pakistanis cannot, you know, uh, come together and arrange a, a marriage and a, a mm-hmm. wedding hall and a walima in a proper way to think that Islam is going to come about by haphazard, by individual efforts is not going to happen. And I thought that was actually a fair point, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> but but subhanAllah, those are, those are my thoughts anyway. But inshallah, I think uh, sort of bringing this podcast inshallah to some sort of a close, um, you know, we discussed many things. Uh, maybe have a, a quick summary because we want our uh, with with one, one thing with the with the voice of the mother we're talking. Then similar to what you're doing, uh, actually, bro, is what we're trying to do is you know, I think what you have with a lot of Muslims, especially the people who come to the Juma, people go to Islamic talks. What tends to happen is that the message that they receive is sometimes one where they think they've done their bit, they attended the khutbah, they attended the talk, it doesn't have any impact on them. It, there's, there's nothing, you know, uh, making them question, where do I play a role in all of this? And they just see the holy man in the, giving the, hat, the hatib as the holy man, you know, we're just the man of the world and, and so on. So I think what we try to do is, we also try to give a message where, you know, some a practical questions. message where people can take away some of the things that we spoke about. So, you know, if, if, there, if there's some things which, we think would be good some last messages that we want you know to uh, to send to the audience mm. if you guys want to I'll start off with you Daniel what, what, what do you think I think that we have to maintain our sincerity first and foremost and if one has a sincere heart um, then Allah will uh, open up the truth to him and will guide him to the truth so ikhlas is really important. Uh, those who seek the truth, um, Allah is not going to hide it from them. Uh, and whenever, unfortunately, we live in a world that emphasizes the superficial, the material, the appearance, um, whereas ikhlas is a matter of the internal, and only Allah knows if someone is sincere. So this is what we, we have to strive for, is, is true ikhlas, true sincerity, to Allah, to his messenger, uh, ikhlas with other believers. All of, so many problems can be solved uh, just, just through that.
Subhanallah, I think. How, I don't know if that's is, practical. <laughs> no, no, no. Subhanallah, I think the thing is sometimes uh, one thing that Brother Daniel has, uh, I don't know if reputation is the right word, but sometimes, uh, as they would say in the UK, uh, you know, rattles the cage with a lot of people because I think uh, sometimes you you just speak the truth and a lot of people yeah. they, don't, they, don't, they don't want that but they say we're in like a snowflake generation where whatever you say kind of someone is offended by it but yeah no I think and to be fair when you see someone taking some flack often that's because that person is speaking the truth so yes, and yeah so we live in that civilization my only last little message is that I think we all need to be involved in activity like what Brother Daniel is doing as well. So activity that is helping the Ummah raise their level of understanding. But I think alongside that, it's important that we also build those ideas in Muslims that are to do with unity, that are to do with we do want comprehensive implementation of Islam collectively. You know, otherwise what sometimes happens and again, it'd be good to quickly get a thought on this as well, Daniel, is that we get so, you know, sometime I might, someone might start a, a little institution or a charity organisation or something and we get so busied in that, that it becomes quite localised and personalised. But then how much of an impact is really that having on the wider problems that the Muslim Ummah is seeing at a global level? And I know as an individual or even a, a team, that's very difficult. But I think it's important to constantly be telling people that actually, yes, we're doing this because we need to do it for our family or for our community but look we do need to work towards things that will help collectively as an ummah as well absolutely yeah subhanallah so also uh, brother daniel it might be good inshallah because i think uh maybe give us a bit of information about uh muslimskeptic.com and uh, alasna because i guess in alasna you've got courses right so yeah. what what are the sort of the the fundamentals what, what what is it you're teaching so just say i was going to subscribe i was going to sign up or just say someone like our viewers want to sign up. What are you offering? What is it? Because <laughs> so the advertising session. <laughs> Why not, bro? <laughs> I appreciate it. No, I'm not complaining. So Alhamdulillah, Alessna, we started it last year and everything is online. So they're pre-recorded. And when you sign up, you can take a course at your own pace and watch the videos. Uh, there's other material that you can do. It's self-directed. And then sometimes we have live sessions, Q&A as well as requested by students. But the subjects that we're teaching on are these ideologies. Um, what is modernism? What is liberalism? What is secularism? What is atheism? Um, all of these kinds of ideologies we address uh, and it's all coming uh, grounded within Islam, grounded in uh, Quran and Sunnah, because we don't want to just reproduce um, a college course, for example, because you can take a college course and get, uh, you know, a, a non-Muslims perspective on these uh, philosophies, but that's not what we want to do. This is not supposed to be, this is supposed to be very practical in the sense that a Muslim taking this is going to feel, inshallah, that uh, their faith is stronger, their confidence in Islam is stronger. They feel more rationally and intellectually fulfilled uh, because that kind of veil, that doubt, the, the shubuhat that was clouding their hearts has been washed because the doubt has been erased or this ideology has been dismantled. right? And so we have, uh, I've been teaching this uh, curriculum for over three years um, outside of Alasna, before we founded Alasna too. And students throughout these three years have said that, wow, I didn't expect, I was expecting like something academic uh, that was just purely intellectual, but I feel like my faith has gotten very stronger. I feel like I'm having more khushua in my salah <laughs> from learning about these philosophies. How, how does that happen? Well, it happens because th these are the sources of the doubts and you're destroying those sources. So then you feel, you know, much more, a very simple example. A lot of Muslims, unfortunately, they go through college system or they want to become doctors or in the scientific fields and they study evolution. And evolution is an idea that is very well accepted. And then that kind of belief in evolution, it uh, makes uh, the ayat of Allah uh, less compelling 
in a sense, because they, when uh, they see uh, a, a beautiful animal or a beautiful, the complexity of the human body or anything like that, they, they think, oh, well, this is just the product of random chance, evolutionary chance. This is what we've been taught. But then in our courses, we dismantle evolution. We show that, no, it is not rationally consistent. No, it has all of these intellectual problems. And there's all this research that shows problem one, two, three, four. And we academically break it down. Then once that happens, once we've erased that ideology, then now when you see the complexity, the intricacy of the human body or of all of this life that Allah has created, then you get a different feeling from it. You get a different taste. The dhawq is there. That wasn't there before. So that has an effect on the heart. Uh, and that's that's just an example, but that's the that's the whole approach. And Alasna is referring to the statement of uh, Umar radiallahu anhu, uh, which he said, Alasna al haq are we not on the truth? And basically, Umar, uh, when he became Muslim, he wanted to uh, openly pray uh, in the haram by the Kaaba and he wanted to be openly propagate Islam and he didn't want to hide and he said are we not on the truth so why should we be embarrassed why should we hide it why should we be shy about it and so this is the kind of attitude that uh, the Institute is meant to inculcate that are we not on the truth so well, let's act like it let's talk like it let's you know and, and everything is academic everything is rational everything is intellectual but we are Islam is more intelligent Islam is more intellectual Islam is more rational Islam is the peak of rationality do we really understand that and taste that and, and feel that so this is what the Institute is dedicated towards. And Muslim skeptic, uh, you know, a lot of the things that I teach, I also write about and put online. So if people don't have time to take a class, uh, they can read stuff online. And it's not just me, by the way, teaching. I have my wife, uh, Um Khalid. Uh, she also teaches at Alasna. She has courses on Islamic homeschool, for example. You don't want to send your children uh, to this state institution that's going to pollute their minds and their hearts with secularism. Okay, what other options do Muslims have? Well, what about homeschooling? This is something that uh, exists and is practiced. How can we have Islamic homeschooling? And so she has, she's also graduated from Harvard, uh, but she's at home and she's homeschooling and uh, we have four children, alhamdulillah. Uh, so she put together a course just dedicated to this. It's very practical. She has a course on what are practical ways to get married in society and do it in the right way, the Islamic halal way. So another course that she's uh, put out and then I focus more on atheism, liberalism, secularism and so forth. So alhamdulillah, we have this material. It's open for whoever wants to take it. You know, whoever wants to enroll, they can just sign up inshallah. That was a really good pitch, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I was just, just a super quick point on that one. You're right to, to highlight, you know, some of these topics. You know, if you go to Western academia, I think I even read something on one of the articles on Muslim Skeptic. And one of the brothers who wrote it, it wasn't one of your articles, Daniel. It was one of the other brothers. And he mentioned that he went to do a certain course, which was purely to do with, like, development and what he wrote was he didn't realize when it started talking about equity and, and the kind of the equality in society, it immediately went towards societies not allow, you know, free mixing, mm. all of these things that are completely against in against Islam, those were things he was being taught in a in a course which he thought had gonna have nothing at all to do with kind of, you know, the ideology mm. side of things. It was more to do with developing a society. Sorry, mm. developing um kind of uh kind of infrastructure yeah yeah so alhamdulillah this is why oh, even those topics we want to learn about them but we need to be able to learn about them from an islamic perspective otherwise the very same topics can corrupt us subhanallah absolutely definitely no inshallah we're, we're trying to you know do the same as yourself uh brother daniel but we're not comp competing with you well they <laughs> are competing with you but Ours is free. <laughs> no, but we'll, we'll, we'll add all the, uh, the the websites and stuff and like links, that because yeah. uh, it's really important and it sounds like you're doing amazing work. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it. And, uh, um, you know, just uh, my final thoughts really is from what you've said and what Brother Daniel said is that, you know, there's a, a great challenge that the Muslims are feeling, uh, we're experiencing right now. But the important thing is to really uh, hold on to the, the rope of 
of Allah, um, which is the Quran and the Sunnah, and be united, uh, of course. Um, and I think the important thing really to understand as Muslims are that, uh, as Allah says, that you know He doesn't change the situation and the condition for people until they work to change that situation, condition themselves. And I think if these are the the the, the messages that people take away, that yeah, there is this situation and. And it might sound dire, certainly the way Brother Daniel puts it. But, you know, at the end of the day, the, the, the change is going to happen <laughs> through us. Through, well, through, through the, victory, the, victory, the victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. The victory, Allah is the one that changed the conditions. But we need to then ask ourselves, is are we um, at a worthy. stage where we can say we are worthy for the victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or are we going to be following the sunnah? You know, it's a funny example where... Like uh, where you hear Bani Israel when they said to Musa Islam, you and your Lord go and fight. You know, are we are we following the Sunnah of the the Yahud instead to say, you know, we'll we just wait for the Mahdi to come or or someone else will come to change our situation. Mm. But I think those are the the key things that I think is important to take away. Um, if there's any, if there's no other comments, I would like to say a big thanks to Brother Daniel. From over the pond, that's what they're saying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. From, from over the pond. And inshallah, bro, there's so much to uh, speak about. Um, and I even I, there were trigger points, to be honest with you, where I could have asked a certain thing and we could have spoken, or should I say, you could have spoken for another half an hour. <laughs> and subhanAllah, you know, but you want to keep the podcast to a certain, certain limit. So, what I would say is that inshallah, ta'ala, hopefully, we'll have, uh, we'd like to invite you again in the near future, inshallah. Well, we definitely want to speak about feminism. Because I know that's oh. something which is, uh, you know, we want to be, we want to do that for a while. Yeah. But I know that's one of your main topics as well, inshallah ta'ala. So, Jazakallah Her for joining this podcast. Yeah, if there's nothing else to say, inshallah, on that note, we'll end. Uh, Jazakallah Her for watching for the people at home. Uh, whether you're listening or watching, you can get all our material on YouTube, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, Telegram uh, podcasts. I should remember this, shouldn't I? But there's so many. Inshallah, we're trying to cater for all different platforms. Uh, so yeah, Jazakallah Khair for watching. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thanks for watching that video. For more exclusive videos, please like, share and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget, you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.